I miss the days where it wasn't just about the in-ring quality. I miss the days when WWE could sit there and put on a great match that tells a good story. I miss the days when WWE matches had proper build-up, had a great build, a great story that made sense to the match itself, that had a finish, that worked for the story. And in the case of WrestleMania 30, the WWE gave me good storytelling in a lot of aspects, and I will get to that momentarily. The WWE gave me solid build-up, which is a good thing. The WWE gave me at least a couple of booking decisions that I agreed with. So, once again, that's a good thing. WrestleMania 30 also gave me a little bit of history, a little bit of emphasis on the past. And I think that every WrestleMania should have that because WrestleMania is where all of this started, where the WWE took off to an entirely new level. That's a good thing. I also thought that the WWE at WrestleMania 30 had a great emphasis on not only the present, but also what is to come in the future. And once again, that is a good thing. And on top of all of that, when you look at the storytelling aspect, you had matches that delivered in the ring that also told a good story. And again, that's a good thing. And this WrestleMania 30 show, for the most part, was really, really damn good. Uh, there are some things that I like to nitpick on for this show. For example, uh, the main card only had seven matches on it. That's something that I just don't agree on. I think that WrestleMania should have at least nine, uh, at most 11. That's just me. You could have easily fit this uh, pre-show WWE tag title match on the main show somehow, some way. I mean, you had some matches that went a little bit too long. I think that the opening match went a little bit too long. And the main event may have went a little bit too long as well. Um, but, WrestleMania 30. We kicked off with one of the greatest segments in WrestleMania history. And this again is where I talk about WWE emphasizing the past and emphasizing history. Here's Hulk Hogan the host of WrestleMania 30. He's coming out. He's cutting this awesome promo. The crowd is already captivated. He does mention the Silverdome, even though they're in the Superdome, which uh, got everyone to chuckle and everyone to laugh. That's, a, again, a good thing. Then you have Stone Cold Steve Austin come out, and he's cutting a promo. And you think that he's going to go after Hulk Hogan and he's going to challenge him to that match that never happened. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Well, unfortunately and fortunately in a way. Um, but here's Stone Cold Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan talking about how much they respect each other. And then all of a sudden, here comes The Rock. And The Rock, the big one of the big three in this ring, he cuts this great promo talking about how much he's idolized Hulk Hogan how much he's loved to feud and wrestle Stone Cold. You compare some wrestlers of today to the stars that were in the ring at the time, Hogan and Austin. You compare Daniel Bryan and his story to Austin and his story. And Cena to Hogan. I don't really agree with that argument, but whatever the case may be. You get this great opening segment, and I'm not really a fan of big-time segments like this at a WrestleMania, but in this case, WrestleMania 30, the 30th anniversary, the 30th show, this worked. In every aspect possible, it worked. And then, after this segment, you get a phenomenal opening contest. Daniel Bryan defeating Triple H to earn a spot into the triple in the triple threat match, excuse me, for the WWE World Championship at the end of the night. Um, 
in-ring chemistry these guys had it. I really, really liked the build-up to this feud. And this is where I go back and talk about storytelling. The WWE, especially over the past couple of years, has struggled in the storytelling aspect to a point where storytelling today is pretty much dead. Here in 2014, you got this story with Daniel Bryan and Triple H. And it was Daniel Bryan trying to stand up to the authority. It was the authority screwing him at every turn. You go back to SummerSlam the previous year, and you have Triple H, after Daniel Bryan had won the title, pedigree Daniel Bryan in the middle of the ring, just to have Randy Orton cash in. And then the next night, or next month, excuse me, Daniel Bryan again wins the title, only for Triple H to come back and say, hey, the decision's reversed because of what happened with the ref. And then the next month, Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, Hell in a Cell, once again, here you have Shawn Michaels interfere on behalf of Orton and super kicking Daniel Bryan. The next month, that battleground, same thing with the big show. And then all of a sudden, you take Daniel Bryan out of this uh, authority story and into a new story with the Wyatts where he finally, it finally gets inside his head that he can't do it. And he turns heel for two weeks and joins the Wyatt family. From a storytelling aspect, it's worked perfectly. And then you had Daniel Bryan finally snapping and saying, you know what, no, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying as hard as I can to finally get it to the authority, to finally stick it in their minds that I'm here to stay. And you had him compete against Bray in a really damn good match at the Rumble, only for him to come up short. Then you have the authority, or well, let me rephrase that. Then you have WWE not putting him in the Royal Rumble. And even though that angered a lot of fans on the internet and in the Pittsburgh crowd that night, from a storytelling aspect, this really, really worked. Why would the authority put Daniel Bryan in the Royal Rumble match? Why not? Why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. So you could be angry about it all you want. But from a storytelling aspect, bravo to the WWE. Because this worked on so many levels. Even at the expense of the freaking Rumble winner, Batista. It worked. And then at the next month, Elimination Chamber. Same thing. You put Daniel Bryan in this Elimination Chamber match. Why? I don't know. But at the end... You have Kane screw over Daniel Bryan. It's just he takes this and that and everything until you finally get to the moment where Bryan gets the shot at Triple H. And with this phenomenal match, Daniel Bryan produced a really damn good WrestleMania moment and followed that up later in the night with another great WrestleMania moment. But first... Let's get to this six-man tag team match, and yeah, this went way too short. I'll agree with you on that, but from the future aspect that I talked about earlier, this again worked. You highlighted the shield. You were obviously going to do big things with each of the three members of the shield in their own way. You knew the path you were going to go with Roman Reigns, you knew the path you were going to go with Seth Rollins. Dean Ambrose, you kind of had a little bit of a question mark, but he's been relatively successful in terms of accomplishments. You knew where you were going with those three guys. Those three guys were going to be the guys. They were going to be WWE's next big three, kind of like how Cena, Batista, and Orton were, and then even if you include Edge as well. Those were going to be WWE's big guys, and they needed this signature victory at WrestleMania as a team. One last time, as this dynamic team, they got this victory over three veterans, Kane and the New Age Outlaws. What more can you ask for? This match didn't really need to go all that long. It didn't need to be all that drawn out, because then it wouldn't have worked that well. 
This match needed to establish them in a dominant way, and it did. Then you go to the first ever Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And while you're emphasizing the past, like I talked about earlier, which is a good thing, you're also emphasizing the future. You have a surprise, Cesaro, out of pretty much nowhere. I thought that they were honestly going to go with somebody like The Big Show, or I think, if I remember correctly, I predicted a returning RVD to get it, but here you have WWE throwing a curveball, and after Cesaro turned on Jack Swagger earlier in the night on the pre-show, here he is at the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, setting up this, in, this incredible WrestleMania moment of him throwing the big show like he was nothing over the top rope to win the match. And here he is in the ring with the trophy, the victor at WrestleMania. Once again, emphasizing the future. So when it came to those three matches, I thought that this match, or excuse me, this night was going to be a special night. It was going to be one of those all-time great WrestleManias. And then we get to Cena versus Wyatt. Let me say this. From a storyline aspect, WWE did a good job with this feud. I I'll give you that. You had uh, Cena face Orton at the Rumble. You had Wyatt interfere there. Chamber match, you had Wyatt interfere there. They were trying to get inside Cena's head. They were trying to get him to face the facts that his style wasn't going to get him anywhere. It was going to... It's kind of like what Kane did in the sense that he, they were trying to get the hatred of Cena to overcome him. They were trying to get the mind games of the Wyatt family to get inside Cena's head to a point where he can't do anything about it. He's powerless. That story worked well. This match, the storytelling aspect, worked really, really well. You had Cena throughout the entire match trying to ignore the Wyatt family, trying to phase out the Wyatt family, only for Luke Harper to get involved, and for Eric Rowan to get involved. And then you had one of the Wyatt members, that I forget which one it was, they pull out a steel chair, and Bray says, use it. Grab it and use it on me. Trying to get inside the mind of John Cena, the mind games aspect, the storytelling aspect, of this match worked really, really well. And it was almost like it was destined to happen that Bray was going to defeat John Cena at WrestleMania. And we never got that. Unfortunately, the storytelling aspect of this entire match was thrown off when John Cena won. Because he overcame this 3-to-1 deficit, this 3-to-1 these three to one odds to defeat Bray Wyatt for absolutely zero reason. And just when I think that the WWE was starting to go to special level of a WrestleMania, to a special level of great, they were taken down a notch. And John Cena won here. I don't really understand why Cena won. When I talk about emphasizing the future, you obviously put Bray in a big spot, which is good, but you needed him to break out with a victory. That didn't happen. And it bugged me then, it still bugs me now. What really bugs me, though, is just when I think that the night was going to get a little bit better after that match. Then you get to Taker versus Lesnar for the streak. Mind you, I was already PO'd that Brock was even in this spot. But this match as a whole lacked the build. And at no point did you really think that Brock Lesnar was going to win. They didn't really emphasize that enough to where you can say Brock is definitely 100% going to win this match. 
and this feud just did not get enough time on television. It didn't get enough attention. It didn't get enough focus. It never really clicked to begin with. It wasn't as personal as I thought it would be. This match, the style of the match, did not work for what it needed to be. I know The Undertaker was concussed, um, but the match just never really clicked. It never really worked, and it got 75,000 people to silence themselves, to be completely quiet. When an Undertaker match can't draw a response, that's not a good thing. And then, unfortunately, you get to the finish, and this was the big response of the match. Brock Lesnar hitting the third F5 to win. I just never thought that Brock was worthy of the honor of ending the Undertaker's streak. I understand that this was something that the Undertaker wanted, and it was something that Vince signed off on. But I never agreed with it, and I still don't. Seeing how the storyline aspect, storytelling aspect worked, or excuse, let me rephrase that. Seeing how this led to Brock's dominant run, I kind of understand it. I still just don't agree with it. That's just my opinion. I just never agreed with it. And this really started to turn WrestleMania 30 back to reality. And unfortunately, what came next was really, really bad. And the fact that you decided to follow up the streak ending at WrestleMania with this Divas match. Why are you putting them in that spot? It's like you're intentionally sabotaging all of those Divas. For what? I have to say though, the Divas in that match, they gave it their all. And despite the fact that the crowd did not care because of what just happened beforehand, these Divas did a great job. A great job. And they had a respectable match given the circumstances of their match, of their spot. It's like the WWE wants to intentionally sabotage them. I don't know why. If you're going to have the streak end at WrestleMania, that needs to end the show. And unfortunately, it just threw off the crowd going into that Divas match and even the main event. We finally get to the main event of this triple threat world title match. Daniel Bryan faces the champion Orton and the Rumble winner Batista. And again, when I go back and emphasize storytelling, this match told a really damn good story. You have post-match of Daniel Bryan and Triple H. You had Triple H attack him. You had Triple H injure his shoulder that was already hurt. Here he is. Doctors are telling him, don't come back. He's getting treated. It doesn't look good. It's looking like it's going to be Orton versus Batista. Daniel Bryan comes out in the match. Batista and Orton double-team Bryan. They take him out. He's being stretchered out. Brian says no. He gets back up, goes back into the ring, and finally the moment happens. Daniel Bryan becomes the World Heavyweight Champion. Unfortunately, looking back at it, as great of a moment it was, as it was, look what it led to. And all of that abuse that Brian took competing at all those shows, house shows and pay-per-views and this and that, just put more wear and tear on his body, and unfortunately now he's no longer with us in a wrestling capacity. So, in a way, this match was actually, or excuse me, this result was actually kind of pointless. Because look at where Brian is now. However, the moment itself was really damn good. And for that, I'll give WrestleMania 30 my stamp of approval. You had a lot of emphasis on history, the present, more importantly, the future. 
And even though the WWE did some off things, like having Cena win for whatever reason, having Brock beat Taker and end the streak, and then putting the Divas match after Brock versus Taker with the streak ending, you also had this incredible moment of Brian defeating Triple H, then going and defeating Orton and Batista for the world title. You, ha- you had Cesaro win. You had the Shield win. You again, like I mentioned, emphasized the future. That is a good thing. And WrestleMania 30, while it's not an all-time great WrestleMania, it still produced a lot of damn good moments. 